Good afternoon. I'm Patrick Mann, Director of the School for Advanced Studies in the Arts and Humanities, and it's a great pleasure to welcome guests, colleagues, students to the annual Robert and Patricia Duncanson Lecture, which is embedded in the SASA Speaker Series. In particular, it's a pleasure to welcome our donor, Mr. Tim Duncanson, and his father, Mr. Robert Duncanson, in whose honor, along with Mrs. Patricia Duncanson, the series is named. In the words that were penned when this generous gift came to the university, the lectures are meant to, in quote, stimulate both thought and discussion with regard to the importance of humanities scholarship and related engagements in a meaningful search for ways to exert a positive influence on complex contemporary and future problems and challenges, close quote. Well, I have absolutely no doubt that the presentation Dr. Naomi Oretsky will give to us today will be fitting indeed. Before I invite our SASA student, Rachel Jensen, to do the land acknowledgments, and then I turn things over to Dean Michael Milde to introduce our guest, I just want to say a few words about our speaker series. This year, in developing our series as a whole, we chose this, the theme, Evidence for the Future, understanding the valuable work that Naomi Oreskes is doing, emphasizing the absolute importance of evidence-based science. In that spirit, we recognize that in a world, in the world of the present, many other scholars from a range of disciplines as well as artists are invested in the necessity of evidentiary arguments and creative projects in the public arena. So this year, our series so far has welcomed Indigenous artist Ken Altman, who's talked about his groundbreaking artwork, which gives evidence of the historical and present-day oppression of Indigenous people in Canada, and also proposes ways forward. Our upcoming guests, Julia Hassan, Peter Meinick, and Tim Caulfield, will undoubtedly give us further proof that excellent art and rigorous scholarship rely on well-informed creative strategies, and incisive argumentation, and armed with the tools such work can afford us, they enable us as participants to be better prepared to look towards the future with clear eyes and commitment. So thank you, Dr. Raskis, for the inspiration. Now, as I'm going to turn the microphone over to Rachel Jensen, who will then pass it on to Dr. Michael Milday, I want to know one final thing. After Dr. Raskis' talk, Leading off the question and answer period will be two SASA undergraduate students, Julia Albert and Rachel Jensen, um, and as well a SASA graduate and PhD candidate in environmental studies, Haley Everett. After their questions, we'll welcome questions from the rest of the audience. So now Rachel Jensen will do the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, Lenapua, and the Audubon peoples, on lands connected with the London Township and Sombre Treaties of 1796, and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant of Law. This land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, who we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors to our society. Thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely to see so many of you, and it's going to be some community on this lousy November day. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see all of you here, preparing to celebrate the arts and manners. It's also uh, my great pleasure to welcome you to the second Robert and Patricia Duncanson lecture. And Patrick, I want to acknowledge that this lectureship was sponsored by Kim Duncanson, in honor of his mother and father. And Bob, we are so delighted to have you here. Uh, thank you for investing in our arts humanities. It's great to be here today. I might almost add, in this day and age. 
So going through the Dungeon Selection series allows us to do a couple of things. First, it allows us to invite a distinguished wizard who will address the role of folks, address the theme of the importance of the arts and humanities, emphasizing the theme's history alongside its present and future significance. Uh, also, rest in this new people of Isaac Musa, as I will explain in a minute. Second, such talks give us an opportunity to reflect on the key importance of keeping a clear sense of our own humanity at the forefront of scholarship and research. In a world that seems to be relentlessly pursuing technological developments and technical solutions, research and scholarship in humanities works like a necessary corrective, reminding us that all of our progress needs to have some purpose, some ultimately human purpose, if it is to be worthwhile. Today's lecture, we are fortunate to have Professor Naomi Oreskes, Distinguished Historian of Science from Harvard University. Professor Oreskes is the author of seven books and many articles, uh, including this book, which will be for sale at the Land of Pocket Lobby, just priming them up, as it were. Uh, she has been recognized by a truly astonishing number of awards, honors, and fellowships. In 2004, she published Beyond the Ivory Tower, a scientific consensus on climate change in the journal Science, one of the leading journals. In this article, Professor Oreskes analyzed her 900 scientific articles to argue that there really is a scientific consensus on climate change, and that the consensus is that the climate is warming. And she has been a prominent vocal critic of climate change deniers ever since. In 2010, Professor Oreskes co authored The Birth of Doubt, in which she documented the close parallels between the strategies adopted by climate change deniers and those adopted by the tobacco industry in its decades-long attempt to deny any of its key cigarettes and lung cancer. In 2014, this book inspired a documentary of the same name, allowing to reach kind of a wider audience. Professor Oreskes has continued her efforts as the recent humanity-centered defender of science, science, and scientific methodology against an array of ideological foes. At a time when the argument of truth and facts threat to become entirely tribal and political, the virtue of Professor Oreskes' approach can hardly be overstated. When the fate of the environment is at stake, when it is no exaggeration to say that the fate of humanity lies in the balance, we need to be able to make the case for what is right, for what is true, for what will really serve our common humanity. So, I know, it is a great pleasure to invite Professor Naomi Oreskes to the podium to speak to the question, why I trust science. For that warm introduction, I'm afraid I started off with a technical difficulty, but there we go. Can you hear me? Sure. Okay, thank you. Well, it's really a pleasure to be back at Western, so thank you so much to Patrick and Michael for inviting me, Jennifer Cramp, who will do all the logistics, and especially, of course, the Duncanson family for making uh, my visit possible. Um, as Michael was speaking just now, I was thinking about, I think I'm kind of living proof of why we need humanistic analyses of all things, including science. Because if scientists could explain effectively to people why we should trust what they did, I doubt the doubt. And so much of what I've done in my work as a historian of science is work that, in principle, scientists could have done. In principle, a scientist could have done an analysis of the scientific consensus on climate change. In principle, a scientist could have written a story of how fossil fuel interests were challenging their own work. Many scientists I know were aware of what was going on. But as scientists, they didn't know how to talk about it, and they didn't, especially didn't know how to write about it. And so a lot of my work has really been about trying to explain things that are happening in science, things that are happening to science, and of course explaining science itself as well, in a way that, as a historian, I seem to be able to do, and my scientific colleagues seem not to be able to do. So one of those things is this book. Uh, my new book, Why Trust Science, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. And I thought I would start by just talking a little bit about why I wrote the book, because I found in the last few weeks since the book has come out, and some interviews, a lot of people have asked this question, well, why did you write this book, and why did you write it now? And of course, you know, the real reason I wrote it now is because I got it finished. But <laughs> You know, a book comes out and it's done, right? So I'm just sort of 
lucky in a weird way that this book seems very timely. It's an issue I've been interested in my entire academic life. And as my husband likes to say, a broken clock is right twice a day. Eventually, the world decided this was an important issue, and I was there to talk about it, and they did. So I wrote this book for several reasons. Um, the first one, and probably the most important one, has to do with giving public lectures. So after I published my paper on the scientific consensus on climate change, I got a huge number of invitations to talk about this work, because many people were very confused on this issue. People did not know that there was a consensus. People thought it was a big debate. Some people still think that. And a lot of people were really interested in hearing about this issue. And so I developed some very carefully crafted historical talks where I would explain to people the history of climate science. Why did scientists even start working on this in the first place? Why did David Gilliam decide in 1958 that he was going to dedicate his entire scientific life to one thing? measuring the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And why did it become a contested question? Because we can answer all of those questions. And so I developed this very carefully crafted historical talk, and I talked about you know, some obscure scientists back in the 1840s who first discovered that carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas and carried the story into the future or into the present. Um, but at the end of the talk, sometimes people would stand up and I remember one particularly, one particular incident that was very, um, very, I can still see this man. He stood up, put his hands on his hips and said, well, that's all very well and good, but why should we trust the science? And I remember standing there thinking, yeah, that's a good question, right? You know, it's kind of like when you teach, you know, we always say, you know, we always want to accept our students' questions. We never want to say to a student, well, that's a stupid question, right? So we're always in class and say, oh, that's a good question, right? And I realized that moment it was a good question, and it was a question that deserved an answer. That many of us who accept the importance of scientific research frankly take that for granted. Most scientists do. Most scientists take it for granted that science is trustworthy, that science as an enterprise is a good thing, and we should trust scientists. But they always never make the case for that. It's almost always taken for granted. And I started to think that in the world we live in today, we really can't afford to take that for granted anymore. It's not enough just to say, trust us, we're the experts. Our audiences deserve an answer to this question, and an answer why science deserves our trust. So there's a second reason I became interested in this question. It has to do with my work as a historian of science, and also someone who is has trained in philosophy of science as well. So anyone who has taken any philosophy of science knows that philosophers have greatly emphasized what we could call the intrinsic uncertainty of science, or the fallibility of science. That we know, both on logical grounds and also on historical grounds, that science is imperfect, that scientists make mistakes, and that even if scientists, even if you have the best scientists in the room, or on the planet, working on a problem, there's always going to be some residual uncertainty. You can never prove anything in science absolutely positively. Um, but if that's the case, if we know that our current scientific knowledge is intrinsically uncertain, then, then why should we trust it? Maybe we should be worried about uncertainty. And we also know that science can be distorted for political reasons. The most famous example in the history of science is science that was distorted for political reasons is genetics in the Soviet Union, the so-called Lysenko affair, when Lysenko, who was a sort of quasi neo Lamarckian, promoted the idea that you could change plants by changing conditions under which you grew them. And modern genetics was essentially thrown out in the Soviet Union for the better part of two to three decades. And this is often given as an example of why you have to protect science from politics, why science and politics should never, um, never mix. So the historians who have studied Lysenko and the Lysenko affair have thought probably more deeply than anyone about this question, why we should trust science. And one of them, I think, has summarized very eloquently what he concluded from this episode. He said, the world's scientific communities cannot claim absolute truth but they can bear to claim that they are closer than anyone else to genuine knowledge concerning a particular field of study. And of course, we now know that Lysenko was wrong, and we also know that modern genetics was largely correct. 
can be reconciled back. But science is in heaven, I'm certain. There is no absolute proof in science. And we do know that sometimes science can be distorted for social and political reasons. Can we re reconcile that with the claim that scientists are still, nonetheless, closer than anyone else to the truth in their areas of study? So that was the second reason I wanted to look at this issue. And the third reason has to do with my work on the interest of doubt. So as some of you know, you just heard, in 2010, I published a very important book, Merchants of Doubt, where we explained, elucidated, what turned out to be a systematic strategy of challenging scientific evidence on a whole set of issues that threaten somebody's self-interest, from the tobacco industry to the modern fossil fuel industry. And the major finding of our research was that the tobacco and fossil fuel industry had deliberately tried to create public mistrust and stress of science that showed the damaging effects of their products. And so this was a deliberate attempt to create confusion, to create doubt, to create mistrust. And so if we know that there have been deliberate attempts to do that, then we must respond to that by countering it and say, well, here's, here's why that's not a good idea. And so that's really what I have tried to do in this new book. For all these reasons, and probably some others, it seems important to take on this question why trust science? To take the challenge seriously and to try in a serious, engaged way to answer it. And not in a flippant way. Not to just say, oh, because it's science, right? Um, I don't know how many of you saw Brenna Turnbin's uh, testimony in the US Congress a few weeks ago. Some, uh, some she, she submitted that to her testimony, the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees of warming, and one of the hostile Republican Congressman said to her, well, well, why should we believe that? And, and she says, sort of incredulously, because it's science. <laughs> right? So I'm going to try to give Greta some backup here. So if she gets asked again, she could have a fuller answer. OK. So when I think of uncertainty, I, I often return to something I learned about when I was in college, which is Costal's wager. So many of you probably know something about Costal, a very important 17th century mathematician and philosopher. And at a certain point in his life, Costal decided that the most important philosophical question that demanded our attention was the question of the existence of God. And Costal came up with a way of thinking about the problem, which is more or less the same as, as what today would be called the problem of type one and type two errors. So he reasoned that, well, he put the question this way. What is the relative risk of believing in God if God does not in fact exist? versus the risk of not believing if God itself, in fact, exists. And he concluded it's definitely better to believe in God. Just think about it. If we make the mistake of not believing, we burn in hell. So, obviously, safer to believe in God than to not. To put this into secular terms, it was one of my philosophy professors who put it, Pascal clutched with a handle of faith. But you may not need it, but it might be safer to hold on to a hand now than not to hold on. And in a sense, that was Pascal's argument. But the idea of science being a leap of faith makes most of us uncomfortable. Science isn't supposed to be about faith. Science is supposed to be about evidence. And yet sometimes it can seem as if it is a leap of faith, particularly when we're given scientific information without any explanation of where it comes from. Well, how do we know that it's true? People um, can say that vaccinations are safe if they don't involve autism. How, how, how do we really know that? And how many of you have ever actually heard an explanation of how we know that vaccines don't cause autism? This is a real question. How many of you have ever actually heard an explanation? A few, but mostly not, right? So it's a few that can answer that question if you want. Right? We, all, we often tell people, oh, it's a fact, but X is a fact of Y. But we also, almost too often, don't actually explain how we know it's a fact. So I think we need to explain how we know it's a fact. What is the process by which scientists come to these conclusions? And that's what this book is about. So the book is not really about any particular scientific thing. It's not about climate change or autism. But it's about how we judge whether or not the scientific claims are true. Because even many academics actually don't know that there's scientific evidence outside their own area of expertise. And I've actually done like a little unscientific poll by that physicists. So do you know how 
what is the argument for our confidence in scientific conclusions? Now, the traditional answer to this, which many of us were taught in school, was the scientific method. The claim that scientific findings are reliable by virtue of the singular method that scientists use to find them. And typically, if you were taught this, the method that is supposed to be the scientific method is the hypothetical deductive method. And by this we mean that scientists develop a hypothesis. From that hypothesis, they deduce consequences. Then they go out into the world and make observations or do an experiment to see whether those consequences are true. And if they are, they say, great, my hypothesis is correct. I'm good to go. And sometimes scientists do do this. We do have examples in the history of science of scientists following a hypothetical deductive model. Probably the most famous is the confirmation of general relativity uh, by Sir Arthur Eddington. So when Einstein proposed the theory of general relativity, one of the deductive consequences of that theory was that light should be bent in the presence of massive objects. Because general relativity told us that the fabric of space-time was dependent upon the mass of the bodies uh, in that space. So if this were correct, then a star, like our sun or any other star, would bend the fabric of space-time and light traveling along that space-time continuum would travel not in a straight line, but in a cur on a curved space. Well, that was a pretty radical suggestion. A lot of people didn't necessarily believe it, but people realized that you could test this by looking at the path of light moving close to our own star, the sun, during a solar eclipse. This test was done by Sir Arthur Eddington, and lo and behold, it was true. And it was considered such an important development that it was actually written up on the front page of many newspapers around the world. It's in the world. This is from the Times of London. You can see revolution in science, new theory of the universe, Newtonian ideas overthrown. So here's a beautiful example of the hypothetical deductive model working. Now, sometimes we refer to this as the deductive nomological model. Nomological, because ideally we don't just want um, a hypothesis, we actually want a general law, like F equals MA, or E equals MC squared. And because anyway, academics always have to use fancier words than ordinary words would do. So, as I said, so the idea of nomological, nomological means law-based or law-like. Ultimately, our goal is to determine the laws of nature. And as I just said, E equals MC squared is a nice example. But it turns out there are a lot of problems with a hypothetical deductive model. One problem is that it's not rapid. It's not actually true. That is to say, as a logical claim, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because of something called the fallacy of affirming the consequent. So if I make a prediction and that prediction turns out to be true, it says not only logically that my hypothesis is correct. And the reason is because false hypotheses can make true predictions. And we can, if you think about it again, you can see probably many examples of that. The most famous example in the history of science is the Ptolemaic model of the universe. The Ptolemaic model said that the Earth was the center of the universe and that all the stars and planets revolved around the Earth. Today we would say that we know that that's not correct. And yet, the Ptolemaic system made highly accurate predictions of the motion of the planets and the timing of eclipses. In fact, more accurate than the Copernican model that was the used to claim this. And so for many people, this was a reason um, to reject the Copernican model because the Ptolemaic model actually did better by the standards of the hypothetical deductive model. So philosophers have spent a lot of time arguing about how and why a false theory can make a true prediction. I won't go into that today. The philosophers have invited me back for a different seminar on that. But whatever the reason is, whether you're a structural realist or you're whatever, we know that as a factual matter, this is true. And there's a secondary problem. It's the problem of auxiliary hypotheses. So when I perform a test of a theory, whether it's an observational test or an experimental test, I'm not actually just testing that theory. I'm also implicitly testing the instruments that I use to do the test. I'm testing the sensitivity of my microscope, the sensitivity of my measuring devices. And there may also be some other assumptions, assumptions from other branches of science that are built into my test. And again, another good example of this is the Copernican theory. So 
where the police sat at the center of the universe, but actually they are communities. And the sun is actually the center of what we now call the solar system. People said, well, okay, we could test that hypothesis, because if this is true, then there's an important thing that could happen, there's an important deduction. And it's a deduction called stellar parallax. How many people here know what stellar parallax is? Okay, again, a handful of dollars. If the Earth moves, we should be able to detect the effects, and one of those effects is this phenomenon. Imagine I'm looking at, well, let's take a cameraman at the end back to give that kind of example. So I'm looking at him, and I'm seeing him over there, and I see him sitting down next to that really nice lady in his uh, face and his real black stripes. Well, thank you for waiting, that's great. So that's what I'm seeing, right? Now imagine it's June, and I'm here, and I'm moving, because I'm consciously, deliberately looking for a different profession. He liked geology, he wanted to be a naturalist, and he was very 
influenced by the work of Charles Lyell, but he was not testing hypotheses. It took a really long time before Darwin even had a hypothesis or anything that we would sort of recognize today as being as a hypothesis. And it came inductively from a mass of observation he had made. Um, I'm going to skip the continental drift just because I think time may be short, but if you're interested, I have lots more examples, and one of them is from my first book, The Debate on the Continental Drift. So I think we'll just skip that today. Okay. But induction and deduction aren't the whole story either. When we look at what scientists do, we find there are other things as well. And one of the other things is logic. There's a long history in the history of science of scientists building models. Why do scientists build models? Well, because a big part of science is trying to understand the causes of natural phenomena. The causes of things we can see. We can see the phenomena, but we can't see the causes. And so how do we figure out causes that are not visible to us? And this is what's particularly an important issue in geology, the earth science, the field I study carefully, because geology is all about looking at rocks and minerals and volcanoes and mountains that have been created millions of years ago. The causes have long since vanished from sight. And even if we were alive then, in many cases, the causes are buried deeper in the earth. So even if you were there, you couldn't see them. So how do we figure out the causes when you can't see the causes? And of course, this was an issue in 19th century medicine as well. Uh, it was one of the issues that Darwin had to face is that we see evolution taking place, although we figure out ways to think about how we kind of sort of do in some cases. But what do you do when you can't see the cause? And so one answer to that question is you build a model. I particularly like this example because it's kind of a fun one. This is Henry Cadell, a late 19th century geologist who was very interested in the problem of mountains. <coughs> how did mountains get made? And particularly, if you looked at mountains, if you went out in the field, you often found that mountains were characterized by these big areas where rocks had been folded, as if they were made of clay, as if they were made of putty, as if they were soft. And yet we all know that rocks are hard. They have this expression, hard as a rock. So how did hard rocks get folded as if they were soft putty? And moreover, if you look closely at these rocks, sometimes in mountain belts, you would see some very distinctive features. So if you look closely here, you can see that these layers are actually broken along little layers. So in real life, these occur. They're called flush faults. They're low angle faults over which rocks have been moved. And some things kind of are even thousands of kilometers. I mean, not really even kilometers. Um, particularly the Alps, people have recognized this. And they have recognized the phenomenon known as naps, where in some cases the rocks have been folded so greatly that they've actually been overturned. So if you looked at a layer of rock, you would see this layer here, and then underneath you'd see the same layer, but reversed upside down. So how did any of this happen? And so Cadell and others began to build physical models in order to test, to test theories of mountain building. And so he was an advocate of horizontal compression, so he built this device. And by the way, you can tell he's a geologist because he's wearing a deer stalker. Uh, and one of the things he's wheel down on his uh, big stick here. Um, so he built this contraption to show that if you compress layers of material, like clay or putty, from the side, you could reproduce exactly the features that he had seen in these mountains. So he argued that this showed that horizontal compression could be a cause of mountain building, which then laid the ground for the continental drift theory. And he also argued that the rocks had to have behaved as if they were clay or putty. So they must have been deep in the earth, they must have been hot. If you warm that if you warm rocks up, they were made from those things, that many of the earth things will decay in a plastic manner if you heat them. So they must have been deep in the earth, they must have been hot. And this helps lay the basis for the debate of the continental drift in the 20th century. Now nowadays physical models don't play the previous roles as they once did. Scientists tend to line up more with computer models and use computer simulation. Climate change is affecting what we see this in a big way. How do we know that the observed warming of the two deepest years is caused by greenhouse gases? Well, because if you model the climate, what you find is that if you try to model the climate, oops, uh, sorry, I'm preparing this as well. 
we know it can affect uh, greenhouse gases, so the radiation, volcanic dust, sulfate, pollution. We also know that we can reproduce preserved patterns in with this greenhouse gas forcing. All that is that we can do. And so that tells us that the role of greenhouse gases has to be part of the story, and in fact, now we have to start on the story. Okay, so in sum, there are many different scientific methods, and at different times and different places and in different disciplines, scientists have used different methods, and they use them well. So there's no completely robust argument that can be made to say that one of these is the method of science. They're all the methods of science. In fact, methods of science are so diverse that the philosopher of science, Paul Feyerabend, famously said years ago that the method of science is that anything goes. Well, he didn't actually say that. This was considered very controversial. He was considered a controversial person. What he actually said was, if you press me to tell you what is the method of science, I would have to say anything goes. Because there is no single method. And in fact, he argued that that was a good thing. He argued the only principle that does not inhibit progress is anything goes. In other words, it's good that scientists are flexible. It's good that scientists are creative. It's good that they invent new methods. That's part of the promise of science. And the methods, they choose the methods that work for the problem that they're dealing with, or that they prefer to end up by using. But then this leaves us with a bit of a dilemma. Because if there is no scientific method, then what is the reliability of science-based science? And that leads to the question of whether or not these different methods have anything in common. And I think that they do. I think that what they have in common is that they're all means of generating evidence. That science fundamentally is about claims that are supported by evidence. And we can generate that evidence in different ways, but however we get it generated, science will confirm that evidence and will only accept the claim if they come to the point where they feel that there is sufficient evidence of sufficient quality to say that yes, this, this claim is true. So I and other historians and philosophers of science um, have come to the conclusion that it's really evidence that's the key element of science, not method. And we should be talking more about evidence and less about method. But then this, of course, pushes back the problem a little bit more, because who judges the evidence? Who decides if the evidence is good enough? And the answer then is scientists. So in some ways, science is a closed shop. It's scientists who generate scientific evidence, and it's scientists who judge it. But that's what it means to be an expert. So how do these experts, how do scientific experts decide when they have enough evidence to say that something's known? And the answer to that is consensus. And by that I mean that consensus is a marker. When scientists come to the conclusion that something is known, they come to agreement, and that's a social process. It's not something that we can define by any logical terms or logical law or logical description. Um, and if you're interested in this, or if you're, again, yeah, you invited back to the philosophy seminar, um, I have another book that I finished last year with my colleagues called Discerning Experts, The Practices of Scientific Assessment in Environmental Policy. And in that book, we look specifically at this question of well, what is it that scientists are actually doing when they come to consensus on an issue? What does that process look like? So that's a different feeling than what you came to. So we can skip that for now. But what we came to in that work, the conclusion we came to was something more or less like this. That what we call scientific knowledge is the body of claims that have been agreed upon by scientific experts. Claims that experts have concluded are supported by sufficient evidence of sufficient quality to say that these claims are true. Or, in another way, claims that experts have come to consensus about. So it's not to say that this consensus is the goal of science. I don't believe that that's correct. But it's to say that consensus is a marker of agreement. It's an emergent property. At some points in history, scientists are arguing. And at some points in history, they come to agreement. And when they come to the agreement, that's when we say, well, we know that it's actually formed by autism, or we know that DNA carries the rain from material, or we know that the Earth is a young moon around the sun and not about the rain dust, and we know that the climate is changing because of human activities. Now, this troubles some people, and I understand that. It kind of troubled me at first when I 
Did you paint the pages with a correct description? Because it can seem a bit like a skill to authority. It can seem like that trust us for experts that I said at the beginning of the talk I think is a suspicious thing. So what I want to say tonight is to make this possibly controversial claim that actually science is a skill to authority. It is. But it's a particular kind of authority. It's not the authority of the individual, no matter how great that individual is. We don't accept general relativity because Einstein is a genius, even though it's often talked about that way. We accept it because it explained many things that had previously been unexplained, and because it made the startling prediction of the bending of starlight that turned out to be true. It's the power of the explanatory theory that persuaded the community of physicists that this idea was correct, not because Einstein is a genius. The fact that he's a genius may have been important that he saw these things in the first place, but that's not when it becomes an accepted scientific claim. It's not when you propose the idea, it's when your colleagues accept it. So another way of putting it is that science is really being judged by the collective authority of diverse experts who have weighed and judged available evidence. Now, I have to say, I'm a little skeptical that these people are actually scientists because they look too happy. <laughs> and they're also really diverse, but I did that deliberately because I'm going to talk a little bit more about diversity in just a moment. But if you look closely at this picture, what are these people actually doing? What are these women doing on the foreground? Amazingly remarkable. And of course, it's not just cars, but I wonder if 
stream in one or two, but I like this example because it's what we most people in the United States have cars. So, but why is this modern car so reliable? It's not because of the genius of Ben and Louis Daniel and Henry Ford. It's because the modern car is the product of the accumulated experience and expertise of thousands of automotive engineers who have worked to perfect a car that we can get into in the morning and drive away. And hopefully, eventually, I need to update this because the next one should be a Tesla, of course, or the sun all the electric car. Um, but it's about the accumulation of knowledge over time, the accumulation of expertise, the learning by doing. By doing, by building cars, we learn to build better cars, and by doing science, we learn to do better science. So the short answer to the question, why trust science? Because our scientific knowledge is based on the accumulated expertise and experience, not of one genius, old man, or geniuses, but of many people working together. And like our cars, and our computers, and our cell phones, science works because of that accumulated expertise and experience. Now, I should say, though, that this is a claim about science as a process. So what I'm saying here is that we should believe in science as a process because, by and large, it has worked well over time. And we can find specific examples of science breaking down, but they're actually not that common in the history of science. So put another way, I could say we shouldn't trust scientists as individuals, but we do have good reason to have confidence in the process of science in which they take part, the process of which they are a part. But this then leads to one more issue. And in the book, I go into this in much greater detail than I will tonight, and I'm happy to talk about this, because it gets back to the man in the audience saying, well, why should we trust the science? The other question that I get a lot in public lecture is the person who stands up and says, well, why should we trust science when scientists are always getting it wrong? And I got this question enough times that I started then asking my interlocutor, well, when you say that, what science in particular are you thinking about? Like one thing they had something in particular in mind. And most times the answer was they actually didn't. It was just some sort of general feeling that science is always getting it wrong, um, mostly from the media. But if they did have an example, it almost always came from nutrition. So I've been doing some work now to try to understand more about nutrition. I've been reading a lot about the science of genetics, the research and so forth. Me, how do we talk about that after we make people interested? So I think that there are some real issues about nutrition, and there's some real issues about how nutrition gets discussed in the mass media, and there are some real issues about how people pick and choose nutritional information, and there are also some real issues about the role of the food industry in creating certain kinds of confusion and misinformation. But nevertheless, despite you know, whatever particularities or particular problems there could be in nutrition, there are cases in the history of science where in retrospect we would say that scientists got things wrong. Absolutely. And so any adequate account of science has to take that on board. So in the second half of the book, I look closely at a series of cases where in hindsight we would say, I would say that scientists got things wrong. And I found a number of interesting things, and I want to focus tonight on two of them. The first thing I found was that in most of these cases, actually all of these cases, there actually wasn't a consensus. So if we say scientists got it wrong, they had a consensus that X. Well, actually it turns out that's not true. It turns out when you look closely in all of these cases, scientists had not actually come to agreement. So this tells us that consensus is possibly rarer than we might think, and really important when we have it. It's a really important marker because these problematic cases almost always don't happen. Uh, and continental drift is the example I know the most about, so I'll talk about it, but I found that you know, all the other examples I looked at as well. So it's often said, and I have to admit, I think I may have even said this when I was younger, it's often said that geologists had a consensus against continental drift, that they more or less uniformly rejected the theory of continental drift when it was first proposed. But that's actually not correct. What is correct is that American geologists, by which I mean people in the United States, also some Canada, Canadians, so we can say North American geologists, 
North American jobs is almost entirely rejected. There are a few exceptions, but not very many. But that was not true in Europe and the United Kingdom. Most European empire geologists reserved judgment. They did not reject the theory. They said, well, we don't know. We don't have evidence to decide. This is very different. Now, it's very different to say this is false than to say, I'm not sure. I think we need to do more work. And most famously, there were geologists in England and also in Australia and South Africa who supported the theory. And some of them quite in a quite articulate way. So if you were to have looked at that debate at that time, if there were some pressing public policy decision that had to have been made, you would have had to have said, well, we don't have a consensus here, and we do need to do more research. And I think that's really important for us to understand, because there are definitely scientific questions for which we do need to do more research, but there are also scientific questions where we know enough to make decisions. So what I want to argue about that is that if scientists disagree among themselves, then that tells us that the issue is unsettled. We don't know the answer. We may need more work. And as citizens, if the issue involves something involving our own lives, like should we give up red meat, for example, we might reserve judgment and say, well, I'm going to wait until there's more evidence. But if there is a consensus, then the argument for waiting falls apart. The second important thing I found had to do with diversity. And that was the other reason why I chose this picture. I spent a lot of time going through Google Images to find just the right picture for this talk. Um, because one of the really important things that comes out of the history of science is the critical role of diversity. In some of these past cases where we would say the scientists got it wrong, what we see is that the scientific community was quite homogeneous. And in hindsight, we can see that they had a blind spot particularly with respect to race or gender or some other kind of bias or group of thinking. And this tells us, and here I'm building on the work of feminist philosophers of science like Helen Longineau, Elizabeth Lloyd, Sandra Harding, that diversity in science is crucial because it helps to ensure that the scientific community as a whole, if not every individual in it, that the community as a whole is looking at the issue from a variety of angles, and therefore, from which any biases could potentially be identified and corrected. And we have a lot of good evidence for this, interestingly enough, not just from science, but also from the business world. Um, there's a very interesting book called The Diversity Bonus about the benefits of diverse teams in business. Um, and that's nice, too, because um, in business, you sometimes have clearer metrics about what your goal are than you do in science. So what we see in these cases is that if the scientists are very homogeneous in terms of race or class or even in terms of their methodological preferences, they can miss important things. But when a community is diverse, and by that I mean methodologically as well as sort of demographically, it's much more likely that someone will say, hey, hold on a minute, there's something wrong here. And so this tells us something very important that I want every administrator in the world to know. Diversity isn't just the right thing ethically, it's also the right thing epistemically. Now, just a couple of weeks ago when I was preparing this talk, I had a cup of tea in London, and I got this tea bag that said, look at, all, look at situations from all angles, and you'll become more open. The Dalai Lama. And I thought, oh, I haven't wasted three years writing this book, I could have just had a cup of tea. <laughs> so sometimes you have, as T.S. Eliot said a long time ago, sometimes you have to go on a long journey just to come back to where you began. Or sometimes it takes a long time to realize that the truth is staring in the face in the form of a tea bag. But I think if the Dalai Lama says it, that it must be right. Um, but maybe there's a slight modification I would make to this. It's not just that you personally will become more open, but also that if you're part of a community, the answers you come up with will be more likely to be correct. So this goes for both individuals and groups. So to conclude, to return to Pascal. So Pascal's, the centerpiece of Pascal's thinking was to ask the question, if I have a problem about which I can never know for sure what the answer is, or at least not in this lifetime, then it behooves me to ask what are the relative risks of taking one position versus another? And we know that for Pascal, the answer to the relative risk question are the biggest existential questions of all, 
we may or may not have written, but that was where he came down. So when we think about climate change, we can ask the same question. And when we ask that question, it becomes obvious what we need to do. Because if we address climate change and it turns out to be a big hoax, then we will have made a better world for everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks. That's a great question. So thank you very much for that. So just to fill in people who haven't read the piece, and sorry, small correction because I have to because I'm like fact obsessed. Uh, it was in the New York Times, not the New Yorker. But anyway. <laughs> so um, also because if you're interested, you can look it up. So yeah, about two weeks ago, I published a piece in the New York Times um, with Nicholas Stern. Who anybody here know who that what is? Yeah, several people. Okay, former uh, chief economist for the World Bank. He's now the head of the Grantham Institute. Uh, at the London School of Economics, a world-famous economist who has done a tremendous amount of outstanding work on the um, economic costs and risks of climate change. And we wrote this piece together because Nick and a group of economists had written a report that came out of the Grantham Institute saying that, he, that they believed that economists were underestimating the cost of climate change because they weren't fully taking into account really the magnitude of many of the changes that were happening and because some of the changes were so potentially great, they didn't know how to quantify them, so they just left them out of the models completely. So when this report came out, I read it, and I emailed Nick immediately because I had written a very similar argument years ago about the same phenomenon in earth science, and particularly in relation to the science of hydrology, where we had seen a similar phenomenon that where hydrologists didn't know how to quantify certain changes that were taking place in the system, they would just leave it out of the model. Now, from the point of view of human empathy, you can understand that because the scientist is thinking, I don't know how to quantify this. I can't just make it up, so I'll just set it aside. And scientists do this all the time. But the problem with setting it aside is that you have effectively made it up. You've essentially set the value to zero. And you know that that's wrong. So there's got to be a better way to look at this. And so in hydrology, there's been a big argument about this. And this will actually help answer your question. Because actually, even when things are changing, history can still help. That's why I love being a historian. Like, there is always something in history that we can draw on. So what hydrologists, so, so there was actually a very famous paper in hydrology. The title was Stationarity is Dead. Because if the world is changing, then the data you have, the historic temperature records or the historic uh, precipitation records will not be a reliable guide to what the future will be like. However, once you recognize that, then you can do something about it. Because if you know that the temperature is increasing and you have some idea what the rate of increase is, then you can adjust those historic records. And you can say, well, the average you know, winter temperature in London, Ontario is X, but we've seen a 10% increase in the average you know, mean temperature in the province, and therefore we can use that to project what the values will be like in the future. So there are things you can do, it's not hopeless, but you have to recognize the problem. And so that's part of what we were saying to the economists. Some of these things are very difficult to be sure. And if we try to figure out how to adjust, 
we will have no less debates about the best way to do that, but that's okay. Scientists are used to robust debate, but what's not okay is to leave it out and to pretend that everything is simply the same as it's been before because we know that it isn't. And so that was the point of the argument. And so the answer is we can look at how things are changing and then use that to project. The other thing I would say about the question of whether the changes are unprecedented or not, this is a very difficult historical question and um, some historians I know have started to talk about it. So in some ways the changes we're looking at are unprecedented in the following sense. I know of no example from history where a human being said, we have to totally change our economic system, and now we have to figure out how to do that. That has never happened before, but what has happened is we have actually changed our economic systems. We have had, you know, by some people's account, more than one industrial revolution, right? There have been enormous changes in history in how we manufacture goods, how we live our lives, how we run our economies. So we do have precedents for massive change. Massive change. What we don't have precedent for is a massive change that we decided we needed for environmental reasons. And that's a big difference, and so we have to figure that piece out. But, but I think history does give us some grounds for optimism that we can make the kinds of changes we need to make in the time we need to make them, although the time is getting shorter, even as we speak. Um, but it is going to require some difference in mindset and particularly here in North America, but I think in a lot of Europe as well, it gets very tied up with the whole issue of planning because after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and this is one of the reasons why climate change is politicized, conservatives took the fall of the Soviet Union to be the proof positive that communism was bad and capitalism was good. And I would broadly agree with that, but they also then made a further claim that I think was mistaken, which was to say that planning is bad, that economic planning is bad, that it's always bad. And that's a little bit of a strange claim because if you think about a business, or you think about a household, or a university, or your life, we all plan, right? We all make plans based on things we expect to happen. Um, and businesses make economic plans of certain kinds, although I know there are people here in the audience that know more about that than I. Now obviously that's not the same as centralized planning as an entire economy. I'm not, I'm not advocating for a revival of Soviet communism, not at all. But I am saying that we, we can't, if we demonize planning too core, then we're going to be in trouble. We have to have some kind of conversation about what does it look like to think about an orderly transition to a different energy system and how can we do that in a way that maximizes flexibility, that maximizes innovation, which we know the Soviet system didn't do, but still get where we know we need to go. And that's, I think, tr very, very tricky. And we need you guys to figure it out because like us old folks didn't figure it out, so. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm sorry that was a long answer, but it was a complicated question. So the whole point of that book was to answer those questions. And the short answer is climate change has been politicized because people decided to politicize it, right? It didn't just become politicized. There was an organized campaign in the United States, mostly in the United States, but it spread to, to some extent here to Canada, to some extent to Australia, a little bit in, in England, so in other English-speaking countries. It's almost non-existent outside the English-speaking world. It was a deliberate attempt to prevent regulation of fossil fuels in order to protect the interests of the fossil fuel industry, but linked to an ideological argument. And the ideological argument was this argument about capitalism and freedom. The idea that if you regulate the marketplace, if you allow the government to plan, that you're on a slippery slope to socialism. And of course, this is partly why this argument is so resonant in the United States and fails utterly in France or Italy, where it's okay to be a socialist, right? But in the United States, that you know, that was a really serious argument. And so conservatives in the United States 
were persuaded by this argument that if you allow the government to intervene in the marketplace to address the market failure, that is climate change, you'd be on this sort of slippery slope to the government taking over the entire economy, and, and not just the economy, but taking over your life. That, um, you know, once the government would regulate tobacco, the next thing you know, they'll be taking away your right to free speech. And, and this may sound exaggerated and implausible, but you know, we found speeches where people said exactly these things. And so this is documented in the book. Why did it work? Well, it worked in part because it what became rhetorically linked to the notion of freedom and individual choice. The tobacco industry was the first to really promote this, but the fossil fuel industry then picked up on it, the idea that, you know, do you want the government telling you whether or not to smoke cigarettes, right? So shifting the debate, not about is the science telling us that smoking is dangerous, because it obviously is, but if we allow the government to regulate tobacco, what will they regulate next? And they actually had a, a series of television advertisements in which they said exactly that. And so they played on the trope of, of individual choice, individual freedom, to frighten people into thinking that if we address these problems, we would lose our political freedom, and our economic freedom, and our personal freedom. And for a lot of Americans, that was a very compelling argument. And so it also helps to, to explain then the sort of political bifurcation, because in general, conservatives in the United States tend to be more suspicious of the federal government. Liberals tend to look to the federal government to solve problems. And so that bifurcation then also resonated with people's belief about government and the government. And then add into the mix the fact that then the fossil fuel industry, because these arguments resonated with conservatives and the Republican Party, the fossil fuel industry then saw the Republican Party as their natural ally and started funneling huge amounts of money into the Republican Party. And we now know that the fossil industry spent over $2 billion in lobbying just to stop the waxman markey emissions trading bill. Just that one piece of legislation, $2 billion alone, just on that. So we know, and this is now documented, that billions of dollars have been spent on advertising, on marketing, on public relations, on lobbying campaigns, on political contributions, all designed to prevent action on climate change. And so there are many people who talk about, you know, the sort of psychological obstacles to climate change, or it's hard to change the way you live, or people don't like bad news, or humans are bad about thinking of, about challenges that are long, you know, in the future. I think all of that is true. But I really think those are footnotes to the big story. I think the big story is this political story, and I think that's why ultimately, even though I do believe that as individuals, we obviously should do whatever we can as individuals uh, to live a less carbon-intensive life and to think about the changes in our homes and in our institutions that would make a difference. Those things are important. But we won't, they won't be enough if we can't do something to change this political system that we have that has been systematically blocking structural change. Uh, even change that economists say are totally rational and sensible, like putting a price on carbon. Yeah, it's a great question also. They're all really good questions. I can see why you got chosen. Um, so this is kind of a good news, bad news story. I'd say, I'll start with the bad news first because it's better to leave people with good news. The bad news is that what we've learned from our research and the research of other people is that the rejection of science is almost never caused by ignorance, by which I mean it's not caused by being not aware of the scientific evidence. And there's lots and lots of evidence of this, but the one that I find most compelling and also disheartening is, is surveys that show that Ameri among, among Americans who identify themselves as Republicans, the rejection of climate science increases 
with increasing education. Yes, that's really depressing for those of us who believe in education, right? So this tells us that this is not simply an information deficit problem. It's not that people don't have access to good information. It's that they actively reject it. And we know something about why, and we have good data on this as well. People do not distrust science generally. In fact, again, there's good news in the story. So public opinion polls, I don't know about Canada, but in the United States, public opinion polls show that overall trust in science is still very high. 70 to 80 percent of the American people say, if you ask them a general question about do you trust science, do you believe in science, do you think that science produces you know, useful knowledge, they will say yes to those questions. But if you ask them about a specific scientific finding, say about climate change or vaccinations or evolutionary theory, then it shifts very dramatically. And then you find large proportions of Americans re rejecting the science in those specific areas, and it correlates very closely with either party affiliation or certain religious affiliations. So what we learn from this is that people are selectively rejecting certain scientific evidence that they feel, rightly or wrongly, clashes with their worldview, their religious views, their political views, or some other perception, economic self-interest also. So that tells us something extremely important. It means you will not change these people's minds by simply throwing facts at them. It's not going to work to, say, to go up to them and say, oh, let me show you some historical records, or let me explain to you, you know, that an epic has a fortune function 10 times as large. No, that has no, like, does no good at all. But if you actually address what they think are misinterpretations of the science, so this is what sociologists call implicatory denial, when you reject something because you don't like its implications. Like, I like this example because I think it's memorable. Like, you see evidence that your spouse is cheating on you, but you deny it because you don't want to admit that that could be true, right? Or think about smoking. We know, and this is the early evidence about smoking came out, a lot of people who smoked, particularly when it became clear that nicotine was addictive, a lot of people who smoked didn't want to admit that nicotine was addictive because that would mean admitting that they were addicts. Right? The respectable, talented, successful person was a dead addict, right? So implicatory denial is a really, really powerful thing, but the means is also very dramatic. So the, the case we know the most about is evolutionary theory. So it turns out that we know that evolutionary theory is much more likely to be rejected by people who identify as evangelical Christians. But if you actually sit down and talk with them, or you can read their writings, it's, they're never, they're not actually quoting scripture. Like a lot of scientists think that evangelical Christians reject evolutionary biology because they're biblical humanists. Well, it turns out there's no evidence to support that. Um, you don't find these folks quoting the Bible. You don't find them listing biblical passages in their society. What you find is the claim that evolutionary theory tells us that life is meaningless. And you find that claim a lot. There's some other ones too, but that's one of the most common ones. So this creates an interesting suggestion to sit down and talk with people about how evolutionary biologists who are religious believers find meaning in life and why they don't interpret evolutionary biology to say that life is meaningless. Or to talk about the many different ways that we can understand meaning in our lives. And so there was a, a study done at Arizona State University, which has a very, very great evolutionary biology program and also a population of students that includes many evangelical Christians. And they experimented with this in the classroom. And they assigned readings by scientists who were also religious Christians, people like Ken Miller Brown or Sir John Houghton in England. And they found that when they did this, it was transformative. And that many of the students who had come in hostile to evolutionary theory, or who didn't even want to take a biology class for fear that it would be, you know, unacceptable, was really changed their views. And many of these students then became open to taking biology classes, to learning evolutionary theory, and to be able to go home and say to their parents, yeah, I'm learning about evolution, and you know what, mom? I can still believe in God, and I can still believe that God has a plan for me, because evolutionary theory doesn't really actually answer that question one way or the other. So there are ways to do it, but it takes time, and it takes learning, right? You have to be open to finding out what it is that people are worried about, and then you can begin to address it. But it doesn't work to just give them more information. Thank you so hard with our students' questions. Can we ask? Sure, of course. 
leader or some metric? I, I don't think so. I, like I said, I think consensus is an emergent property. I think scientists know it when they have it. And I think, you know, we see this, say, in the IPCC, that they've worked hard to try to articulate what that consensus is. I think if you tried to measure it or have some kind of metric, it would put a kind of pressure on the community to think they have to achieve, you know, 95%. And I think that would be counterproductive. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say that. I mean, everything I've tried to do is that, right? Everything I write, everything I do is about marshalling evidence, you know, even evidence about evidence, right? But putting it together in a compelling story, right? And I guess, you know, one of the things I feel proud of and I, I feel hopefully is a model for other people to say that this can be done, that <laughs> you can have a successful academic career telling compelling stories about scientific questions, about evidence, about all these issues. Um, yeah, and I, I was just going to say one of the I actually find it like in a way it's tragic that Keith and Wordsworth thought that because of course it's not true, right? I mean, I was trained as a scientist to go out physics and math and call it, you know, I think rainbows are pretty amazing. And uh, so I, I think there is. You're right though that scientists have themselves felt as if they shouldn't speak in the language of empathy and understanding. I think that's an error, and I think your question also got at that too, right? If we want to talk to people whose position is different than ours, we have to do it from a position of understanding why this is why they, they have the views they have. And if we just give them data, that doesn't work. And we know that it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I also want to do a couple of commercials. Uh, people are welcome. 